New merchandise available on JG9Shop.com. From redesigned 39.6 merchandise to backpacks to ugly sweaters to bucket hats, we've got it all. Plus, now available, we officially have Drink the Spike mugs and glasses. For those who like their drinks more than they like quarterbacks that spike the ball into the ground on every single play. Go to JG9Shop.com for the latest JG9 merch for this holiday season. And now, on with our feature presentation. Think of the last time you picked up a golf club, or swung a baseball bat, or shot a basketball. Maybe it was recently. Heck, maybe you did it today. But imagine if the last time you did this physical activity was over a decade ago. You hadn't done it in at least 10 years. Now, imagine that you pick up that activity now, ending this decade-long hiatus, and you wind up achieving the greatest goal with said activity. You swing the golf club and wind up hitting a hole-in-one on your very first shot. You take the basketball and drain a full-court shot on your first try. You get the idea. Something like this seems ridiculous, and seems like there's no possible way that it could happen. Well, this is Jarrell Thomas. He's a running back who, while you're seeing clips of him now as a member of the Los Angeles Rams, would eventually find himself on the Kansas City Chiefs. He hadn't thrown a football in over a decade, not in practice, not in a game situation, and not in anything along those lines. And yet the Chiefs, for some reason, decided to call his number on a trick play, despite Thomas being rusty for the past 10 years in this department. What followed next, as you can probably guess by the title, was the most surprising touchdown pass in the over 60-year history of the franchise. And this is the crazy story behind that play. Before I talk about the pass, we need some context to understand just who Jarrell Thomas is, why he was on the Chiefs in the first place, and how the game was going. Our story begins three years before, when the Los Angeles Rams drafted the San Jose State running back in the third round of the 1980 NFL Draft. Oddly enough, this is not the first time I've done a video about a running back that the Rams drafted in 1980, as I talked about the somewhat bizarre career of their 7th round pick, Jerry Ellis, in a previous video of mine. To learn more about him, click the card in the upper right corner. And much like Ellis, Thomas was initially buried on the pack depth chart at running back, with guys like Wendell Tyler, Colin Bryant, and Elvis Peacock, the Rams' first round pick from 1978, ahead of him. However, after not doing much of anything to start off the 1980 season, touching the ball just 33 times over the first 14 games of the season and never finding the end zone, everything seemed like it was going to change at the end of the year. Over the final two games of the 1980 season, there might not have been a better running back in football than Jarrell Thomas. He seemingly came out of nowhere to take the football world by storm. On December 15th, in a Week 15 Monday Night Football game against the Dallas Cowboys, the Rams won 38-14. And Thomas may have been the biggest reason why as he ran for 147 yards on an astonishingly high 9.2 yards per carry. He even scored the first offensive touchdown of his career. And to close out the 1980 regular season in a 20-17 victory over their NFC West rivals in the Atlanta Falcons, Thomas had another great game, running for 144 yards on 7.6 yards per carry and scoring another rushing touchdown. I did a deep dive into that game and how it ended, so if you want to learn more about that game, then click the card in the upper right corner. Over the final two games, Thomas had 291 yards rushing and two touchdowns and over 8.3 yards per carry as he helped guide the Rams into the postseason. That's pretty good if you ask me. However, while some people had high hopes for Thomas now that he seemed to break out, those hopes never materialized. Thomas got buried on the depth chart over the next two seasons, and did next to nothing. From 1981 to 82, he had just 50 rushing attempts and 198 yards, never finding the end zone. He only had one game with double-digit carries, with the exception of a 1981 game against the Saints, where he had 75 rushing yards even though the Rams lost 21-13, Thomas never had a single game with at least 30 yards rushing. By this point, Thomas was an afterthought, and especially after the 1983 NFL Draft, when the Rams spent their first round pick on one of the greatest running backs in the history of the sport in Eric Dickerson, it was clear that Thomas's days in Los Angeles were numbered. Fortunately, he was about to find a new home. Unfortunately, there's no way to tell this story without bringing this up. In 1982, the Chiefs did not have a great rushing attack. They ranked 21st in rushing yards, 27th in rushing touchdowns, and 24th in yards per attempt. They were one of the worst running teams in football and were incredibly fit at the position. However, while they definitely needed depth, they seemed to be pretty set at the starting spot heading into 1983, as they had Joe Delaney leading the way, who was about to enter his third season and made the Pro Bowl as a rookie and averaged 4 yards per carry in 1982. However, tragedy struck in what many consider to be the most heroic act by any player in NFL history. On June 29, 1983, Delaney tried to save children who were drowning in a pond. In an attempt to save the children, Delaney sacrificed his life and tragically died at the age of 24. More than four decades later, 
Delaney's act of sacrifice and heroism is remembered today, and Delaney is rightfully a member of the Chiefs' Ring of Honor for his actions. And while it is almost impossible to transition from that into on-the-field action, because the last thing anyone could think about after Delaney's death was a game, his tragic death left the Chiefs with a glaring hole at the running back position. With the Rams knowing that Dickerson was progressing nicely, and knowing that he was ready to get the bulk of the carries, they were ready to offload Thomas to a team that needed him. And the Chiefs, who were thin at running back and did nothing of significance in the offseason to address this, because they thought they would have Delaney with them, seemed like the perfect trade partner. With just two weeks to go before the start of the 1983 regular season, the Rams traded Thomas in exchange for cornerback Eric Harris, who had started 24 out of the possible 25 games with the Chiefs over the past two seasons, and had recorded 17 interceptions over the last three years. Chiefs head coach John Makovic knew that Harris was a really good player to be giving up, but he was excited about the prospect of bringing Thomas on, saying that he was bigger, stronger, and maybe faster than any running backs that the Chiefs had now. As Makovic said, he's been a strong runner and hasn't been hurt. He is very interested in becoming a starting player. The Chiefs were excited to trade for him and give him a chance to showcase his running abilities. Little did they know that instead, he would get a chance to showcase his passing abilities. September 4th, 1983. It's opening day of a brand new NFL season, and we're at Arrowhead Stadium for this AFC West matchup between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Seattle Seahawks. Obviously, this is a pretty big game for both teams, since it's opening day, and you want to start the season out on the front foot. Additionally, because of the way the schedule worked out during the strike short in 1982 campaign, where only nine games were played after two months were completely cut out from the season, the Seahawks and Chiefs, despite being in the same division, never played each other in 1982, although divisions didn't really exist that year. This would be a nice rekindling of that rivalry, and especially since the Chiefs had what seemed like a gauntlet of a schedule early on, having to play San Diego and then both Super Bowl participants in Miami and Washington over the next three games, a win here against Seattle would help out a lot. And it's a pretty low scoring affair early on, with neither offense able to get a whole lot going. It didn't seem like it was going to be that way at first, especially after Seattle scored on its first drive of the game on a 34-yard field goal by Norm Johnson, and after Kansas City immediately answered on their first drive by scoring a touchdown, with Bill Kenny throwing a 9-yard touchdown pass to Henry Marshall. However, despite the strong opening drives from both teams, those were the only points of the entire first half, as after the first 30 minutes of the contest, the Chiefs were leading at 7-3. After the teams exchanged punts on their opening drives of the second half, the Seahawks were finally able to strike again, as midway through the third quarter, Norm Johnson hit a 48-yard field goal to make it 7-6. As a side note, if you want to learn more about the career of Norm Johnson, they click the card in the upper right corner. Kansas City needed a big drive here. Their defense was in the bottom half of the league in 1982. They were not going to be able to hold the Seahawks forever. After six straight drives ending in a punt, with the Chiefs failing across midfield on their last three drives, they needed something to swing the momentum back onto their side and get the home crowd fired up again. And it seemed like the Chiefs are starting to string something together. Bill Kenny completes the pass to Anthony Hancock on the first play of the drive, setting the Chiefs up near midfield. Later in the drive, Kenny converts a big third down, hitting Ed Beckman on a 17-yard pass to put the Chiefs in Seattle territory. And then on third and 19 a few plays later, Kenny throws a 22-yard pass to Henry Marshall to somehow keep the drive alive and give the Chiefs their third first down of the drive. What followed next might be, considering the circumstances, the most surprising touchdown pass in the history of the Chiefs franchise. Before I show the play, one quick side note. We've seen trick plays before where a halfback throws a pass, but there is one small problem with the play we're about to see. The running back here is Jarrell Thomas. The original play was a run, which is what running backs do. He was never supposed to throw a pass here. Better yet, he didn't really know how to throw a pass. The Chiefs never practiced this play. I remember that Thomas was only acquired two weeks before, so he was still grasping the playbook as it was. And while there are some running backs who could occasionally throw a pass to catch the defense off guard on a trick play, Thomas was not one of them. In his three seasons with the Rams, he never threw a pass. In his four seasons of collegiate ball, whether it was from 1978 to 79 at San Jose State or from 1975 to 76 at UCLA, he had never thrown a pass. The last time he ever threw a pass, while we don't have an exact date or an exact game, was at minimum in 1974 when he was in high school and was playing for Hanford out in California. And again, Thomas did not practice this play before. He had not thrown a pass since the fall of 1974. And this game took place on September 4th, 1983, nearly a decade after. For some perspective, the last time Thomas threw a pass, whether it was in practice or a game, The Godfather Part 2 had not been released yet. 
No one really knew who Barry Manilow was yet. And the Pittsburgh Steelers, the team that became one of the greatest dynasties of all time in the 1970s, had yet to make it to the Super Bowl. With all that in mind, Jarrell Thomas did this. Roll the tape. Somehow, Jarrell Thomas, despite not throwing a pass at any level in nearly a decade, threw an 18-yard touchdown pass to Carlos Carson. That play was massive, and that's not overselling it. The Chiefs jumped out to a 14-6 lead, making it the first two-possession lead by either side of the game, and they would eventually hold on and win the game 17-13, winning on opening day thanks in part to the heroics and the surprising arm of the player that they had just acquired two weeks before. And after the game, all the talk was about that passing play. And it seemed like Thomas was in a general state of disbelief at how everything played out. He said, I was really tempted to run it. I'm not one for form when it comes to passing. That's the first pass of any kind I've thrown since I was in high school. I kept drifting toward the sideline until I thought I was going to run out of sideline. Finally, I thought to myself, if I run it, the chances are low that I'll get into the end zone. Thomas seemed to have little faith that this would work. He didn't even plan on throwing it and just decided to chuck it up just because even though it was first down and there was nothing wrong with just eating the play. Seahawks head coach Chuck Knox, who was coaching his debut with the team and was on the opposite sideline, was also in disbelief that this would work, saying, We had two guys there. It wasn't like we were fooled and there was nobody back there. It took him forever to throw it. I was the most surprised person in that stadium when it was completed. And Chiefs receiver Carlos Carson, the man who caught the pass, was in disbelief as well, saying, I didn't think Jarrell was going to throw it. Nobody thought this play had a chance at working. Nobody believed in it, and why should they have considering the circumstances? However, it turned out to be the game-winning touchdown pass and turned out to shock everyone. Unfortunately, this would be the only highlight of Jarrell Thomas's career in Kansas City. When the Chiefs traded away their starting quarterback for Thomas so that the running game could get better, I don't think they anticipated that the only touchdown that Thomas would contribute all season would be that touchdown pass, and that he would do nothing whatsoever with his legs. However, this trade went a bit haywire for Kansas City, as despite the fun debut with the touchdown pass straight out of nowhere, the Chiefs would get no more contribution from the former Rams running back. Thomas had just one game where he averaged at least 3 yards per carry, and only carried the ball 44 times for 115 yards all season, never finding the end zone. After Week 6 against the Los Angeles Raiders, Thomas never touched the ball again on a handoff, as he was phased out of the offense. In 1984, Thomas found himself on the San Diego Chargers, while he would score two touchdown runs, with both coming in the fifth week of the season against the Detroit Lions from one yard out, he would do nothing else, as he finished the season with a career-low 14 rushing attempts and a career-low 43 rushing yards, as well as a career-low zero receptions and zero receiving yards. By the end of the 1984 season, Thomas was out of the NFL for good, and would never play again. If you told someone after the final two weeks of the 1980 season that this would be Thomas's career trajectory, I'm not sure how many people would have believed you because it was a somewhat disappointing end after what seemed like such a promising and explosive start. However, the one thing that Thomas is known for roughly four decades later is his surprising arm and his surprising touchdown pass. And honestly, I'm not sure how it gets any more surprising than this. Considering the fact that he hadn't thrown a pass in practice or a game or in any situation at minimum since 1974, this play should never have worked. Considering the fact that the Chiefs had never practiced this play before, and only acquire Thomas two weeks before with minimal time to adjust, this play never should have worked. Considering the fact that the Chiefs' offense was stagnant and stifled all day, this play never should have worked. And considering the coverage on the play, and the fact that Thomas was never even supposed to throw this pass, this play never should have worked. Yet against all odds, it did. And because of it, what Jarrell Thomas on this play did might be the most surprising touchdown pass in the over 60-year history of the Kansas City Chiefs franchise. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gator 9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.